Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ron Daniels, and uh, it's my privilege to be president of uh, the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, what a great day this is at the uh, Whiting School, uh, and a day that we get to uh, share annually, which is, of course, the Blumenthal Lecture. And I want to, on behalf of Dean uh, Nick Jones, on behalf of uh, Mrs. Mitzi Blumenthal, on behalf of uh, colleagues from the Whiting School of Engineering, to be able to welcome you to uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, today, we're uh, truly delighted, honored, thrilled uh, to be able to have Wireless Pioneer, legendary entrepreneur, and Qualcomm founder, Dr. Owen Jacobs, uh, with us. And I'm especially pleased uh, to be able to share this day uh, with his wife, Joan, uh, who traveled to the East Coast in winter, no less, uh, to be here for this event. Um, now, uh, this has got to be the irony of all ironies, but I've been instructed firmly, persistently, vigorously, sincerely uh, by Megan that I have to do a bit of housekeeping here. This is a division responsibility. Um, I do the housekeeping stuff, the dean does all the good things, but I'm supposed to say, please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> okay, I've got to see you all doing this. Um, and of course, that is a... Uh, we, have, we have one member of the audience who's being a bit recalcitrant, <laughs> and I would urge the dean to take uh, some measures here to deal with his guest speaker. Um, it, of course, is a great irony uh, that I ask you to sell, silence your phones in order to listen to the man, of course, uh, whose uh, ideas revolutionized wireless communications as we know it. Indeed, the intersection of ideas and their expression in the real world lies at the very core of this lecture series. Although uh, Sydney is no longer with us, in establishing this series, uh, his benefaction allows the university community to learn from visionary leaders uh, who have transformed our technological landscape. Each year, they share their perspectives, insights, and the occasional hard-learned lessons about translating flights of imagination into the march of progress. And I'm told that they do this in a way that's even intelligible to a lawyer, uh, which is uh, very encouraging. Uh, by their example, they enlighten, inspire, and challenge us to harness our intellectual potential and to propel us to even greater invention. Um, it's a real honor and a privilege, uh, Erwin, that you're with us today. Um, I know uh, well the many demands on your time, uh, the many uh, business and philanthropic endeavors that you engage in, you and uh, Joan both engage in, and the fact that you're here on the Hopkins campus and have uh, uh, committed yourself uh, with such enthusiasm to getting to know us and spending time with us is a real uh, uh, honor for us. We are indeed privileged to have here today Erwin Jacobs and his wife Joan with us. Erwin and Joan are widely recognized for, their, for the leadership role they play in supporting the arts, theater, and libraries in their hometown of San Diego. And it has been a treat for us to have them uh, to see a little bit of our city and, and campus. In fact, uh, yesterday evening, I had the pleasure with uh, Winston Tabb, Dean of the Sheridan Libraries, to uh, spend uh, the evening and having dinner with Erwin and Joan, and we had a uh, wonderful um, evening together, and indeed reaffirmed the fact that it is a very small world because in the number of people that um, Winston and Erwin and Joan knew in common was really just uh, remarkable, but we had, a, we had a wonderful event. Erwin has actually a very special uh, connection to Johns Hopkins, and that is through Professor Fred Jelinek, uh, a distinguished member of our faculty known to many of you in this room uh, who passed away last year. Fred and Erwin were classmates at MIT, and it is because of that friendship that we have the opportunity to have Erwin here with us today. I know, Erwin, that Fred would have been thrilled to have you and Joan here at Hopkins. I might mention also another connection. Erwin is chair of the board of trustees at, an, at a place called the Salk Institute, uh, and in fact established the Erwin M. Jacobs presidential chair at that institute, a chair now held by our former president, Bill Brody. Erwin is perhaps best known as the co-founder of Qualcomm Incorporated 
and the pioneer of the use of CDM8 in digital cellular technology that has profoundly influenced the way we connect, collaborate, and communicate with each other. The success of CDMA is more than just a technology story. It is a story of vision, passion, determination, courage, and patience. It was Irwin who championed th this technology and managed it to success, and in doing so, drove and transformed the industry. But, but long before any of us used cell phones, Irwin worked in academia, in the laboratories and classrooms of MIT and UC San Diego, collaborating with faculty members like us and teaching students like you. So this setting today is one that I know is familiar to him, and I know that he will easily transition back into his role, former role, as a faculty member and share with you some of the lessons he has learned in what is a truly remarkable career. So with no further delay, I present to you our distinguished guest, Dr. Erwin Jacobs. Thank you, and it's a great pleasure for us to be here today. Of course, we all have heard about Johns Hopkins for many years and the many great things that have occurred here. And it was through Fred Jelinek that I first had the contact to come and be able to give a talk here with you. And then, of course, the terrible news that he had died at such a young age. But I do remember him well from our days at MIT, from his professorship at Cornell, his time at IBM, and I'm not quite sure where that's coming from. And um, then, of course, coming to Johns Hopkins, uh, he was a very special person. I'm going to uh, start out with a little bit of history uh, of myself and how I be became involved with moving from academia over to uh, the business. Uh, I had been teaching at MIT. I had uh, been fortunate enough to become involved with information theory. Is there a speaker behind me or something there? Try it. Is that a little better? Okay. Someplace it's catching me. <laughs> um, uh, had been lucky enough, in fact, to write a textbook on digital communications, uh, and it was essentially the first textbook written on digital communications with another professor from MIT, um, Jack Rosencraft. My wife and I took uh, our one visit to California in 1964-65, found we liked it very much, went back, and just after getting back to Boston, had an invitation to come out and teach at the brand new university, University of California, San Diego, which we turned down, but then two days later decided maybe that was an exciting thing to do, a whole new school, new curricular, new students, and uh, so out we moved to uh, California. Um, when we arrived, you can see from the picture that basically uh, there were three significant institutions there the brand new University of California, San Diego. It was based on the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, which was a great and remains a, a, a great institution, and San Diego State University, which is also very good, but essentially no commercial industry. Uh, after arriving, there were lots of requests for consulting. I happened to mention that to a couple of friends on the UCLA faculty, and they said, let's start a company and share consulting. So that's how a company with a strange name, Linkabit, was formed. Strange names, as you go to set up your own companies, you find that you can submit a list of names. Most of them have already been spoken for, and finally get down far enough on the list and you get one that is acceptable. So that's how we ended up uh, with Linkabit. Uh, I mentioned to a previous class, we uh, started as a consulting company, therefore we didn't have a business plan. We didn't have any significant financing. We did, for a number of years, rely on government business, which was if you had a good idea, was, it was possible to, to get contracts fairly easily. That's no longer the case. And we came up with our approach, moving from consulting to more serious business, that uh, we would try to look for innovations, look for things that could be done differently, better, and could hopefully have a market and be able to bring in some dollars. 
Uh, it did begin to grow in 19, uh, get my decade straight here, 1971, I took a year's leave from teaching. 1972, we decided that the business was indeed great fun and ended up leaving academia after 13 years and being in business full time. One of our first projects had to do with the ARPANET and in particular with extending the ARPANET over to Europe. And uh, we managed to do that successfully, although without the support of any of the so-called PTTs, the telephone companies, none of whom believed that there was any future in packet switching. But luckily, we did have a few universities to help uh, support the program and a few government laboratories. And so we were able to move it ahead. We recently celebrated an interesting anniversary that at the time, I don't think any of us thought very much about. But uh, there was uh, a couple of engineers uh, had come up with an internet protocol, protocol for attaching different disparate networks together and having them function together. And uh, so we connected the ARPANET, this satellite network, over to Europe, and uh, a packet radio network, which actually was a very expensive version of what we now think of as cell phones that carry data. But three very different networks, and luckily the technology did work. And of course, it has now come a long way since then. So that was one of the early projects that did get me obviously excited about the kind of work uh, and leading a group of other companies and laboratories uh, through that. Um, as I mentioned, we were involved very much with government work. I won't get into the details, but we did develop a satellite terminal, uh, again, fairly early on. But we were competing with another company that had built and was building a similar terminal, but took several racks of equipment built largely with hardware. And we came up with the idea of using, again, this is the innovative parts, using a microprocessor, which didn't exist at the time. You had to build it out of separate pieces, but a microprocessor with code to do all of the communication functions. And we came up with a device called the dual modem. And one of the stories I like to tell is that we were able to meet all the requirements of the government uh, with this, and obviously much more compact, much less expensive than uh, competition, uh, but we had to convince the Air Force project manager to fund us to go into manufacturing, to go into production, to do all the paperwork that was necessary. And I went up to see a general in Los Angeles, and he started out by saying, as a project manager, I have to keep everything as highly probable as possible. That generally means working with a large company that's done this kind of job before, and we have that in this other company. And so I thought that was it. And then he said, however, I'm also a taxpayer. And he said, as a taxpayer, I think you've got a wonderful approach here, et cetera. We did get the money to go into manufacturing. We did go into production, and that gave us a tremendous base for many of the other things that we did do at Linkabit, the first company. And I'll finish here. There were a number of very interesting products. Uh, another one was satellite to home television. And again, this was before there was much of this. Initially, HBO wanted us to deliver satellite uh, programming, programming via satellite to cable heads. A political dispute came up that uh, backyard dish owners didn't want to be left out, and therefore we had to build a home descrambler, which had to be inexpensive and uh, reliable and uh, small. And we, to do that, we needed to develop chips. At that time, it's harder to believe, uh, this was now the late uh, 70s, uh, at that time there still wasn't software available to develop chips other than in a few universities. And so I'd sent out a few of our engineers to go visit the universities to learn about the software, bring it back, and with their permission, we were going to put it together and build a, a, a way of developing chips. The need then for a home decoder caused us to, rather than doing some simple problems with this software, to go and develop three chips that all did work out that, among other things, convinced us that, indeed, this ability to take the right software, the right chips together, 
did provide you with great market. So those are some of the products that we, uh, that did, we had done at Linkabit that were very successful. I sold Linkabit in 1980, left the company in 85, and retired uh, for about three months. One of the other things I'm very pleased about is that there, the last count, were about 150 companies that had started in the San Diego area from people who had worked or second generation had worked at Linkabit. So this idea of being innovative, coming up with new ideas, of trying to introduce technology did work for many uh, other companies. And so that's been very positive. One of those companies was Qualcomm. And um, while I was in this three-month retirement period after leaving Linkabit, uh, six other people who'd worked with me at Linkabit said, we ought to do it again. By July 1st, we decided, OK, we will give it a try. Don't expect it to grow as well and as fast as Linkabit. Uh, we did not have any products. We didn't have a business plan. We did know digital and wireless should have a great future for us. And so we went ahead and started the company. Very early on, within the first several weeks, we were on doing a consulting program up at Hughes Aircraft on a satellite, a mobile satellite, that they had proposed to the FCC. And they had hired us to look to see if there was something we could do a little better technically or whether there were any mistakes in what they had done. And on the way back from our second meeting, it occurred to me that CDMA, and I won't go into technical details, but Code Division Multiple Access did offer some significant potential improvements. We weren't obviously sure at the time. Uh, we went back, described it to them. They uh, were doubtful, as by the way, for the next several years, anybody we described it to was doubtful. Uh, but did give us a little funding to build a, uh, a little prototype of a satellite and of a receiver to check out the ideas. That all worked out, but then they stopped their funding completely on the program because they realized the FCC was going to take several years before it might imp uh, improve their uh, satellite system. We didn't have the money to go ahead and develop the CDMA further ourselves, so we set it off to one side and went ahead and developed this first product called Omnitrax, which was a satellite system aimed at supporting the trucking industry. Uh, it again required great innovation. In particular, it required spread spectrum because we were having trucks drive around, including being close to large fixed antennas that were receiving signals from these satellites. They had to be able to do that without interfering with those signals. So it was a Significant technical problem it was another technical problem with designing the antennas. But again, came up with that. And by the way, all of these areas, and I keep reiterating it, required often some very basic information. We've gotten back at the university in very basic courses, such as how do you design an antenna that's very inexpensive, very reliable, and can continue to point at a satellite as a truck drives around. It was an interesting uh, problem to solve. We sold our first major, our first major sale was October of 88, and immediately we turned our attention back to CDMA to see what we might be able to do with CDMA. Did it really hold up in the cellular as opposed to the satellite environment? We had thought it would, but we weren't sure. And so we went through some more analysis. We went through uh, some further improvements that would go along with CDMA. We then simulated the whole thing on a computer system, and in about three months or so, we were confident enough that this was worth looking at to go out and talk with an operator. And in particular, Pactel Cellular was just up the road from us, and so we talked with them. And again, the first reaction was kind of crazy, but you folks have had some success in the past, so we'll, uh, we'll listen and, and provide some level of, uh, of support. And so um, they did allow us or support us in making a presentation to a group of people from the industry, perhaps about 50% larger than the group here, and did that uh, in June of 1989. And I thought there was probably a 50-50 chance that somebody, one of these experts, would find something we had not thought of on CDMA, why it wouldn't work. And, um, at the end of that, the only question was, why aren't you going out for a standard already? So there were no technical issues. On the other hand, nobody quite, again, believed us. And anytime you go out 
to try to do something new, something innovative. You're always going to have lots of skeptics why it won't work, and others who are worried that if it did work, it might displace some things they're doing, and therefore will be negative as well. So we figured the only way we'd be able to proceed is to go ahead and build a demonstration system. And we did that. You can see a picture of it. Uh, as I often say, our mobile phone required a van to drive it around. <laughs> and uh, we then invited everybody back to, uh, invited everybody to San Diego in November of 89, so just one year uh, later after we had approached, uh, thought about this idea, we had the equipment ready, invited people back for a demonstration. The demonstration almost failed because the GPS satellite coming over the horizon that we were relying on for time and frequency had a bug in it. It wasn't operational yet. Got that fixed, sent everybody out, and sure enough, the CDMA system did hold together well enough, provide the kind of results that we uh, wanted to demonstrate. Many people had already looked at CDMA and given up on it, so it did take a, some significant effort to be able to at least say this is still worth looking at. Um, However, this was obviously not commercial equipment. And so the next step was, how do you get commercial equipment? Well, again, you have to go back to those little chips. And we've had that experience at Linkabit. We had now better software to work on uh, chips with Qualcomm, but it was still a very expensive undertaking to go ahead and get all the technology onto uh, the chips. And so uh, we needed funding. We uh, then decided to follow a rather innovative business plan, there weren't too many people doing it at the time, by offering to license manufacturers to use CDMA. That is, we would license all of our existing patents and future patents. They would pay us a license fee up front, which would give us money to do the R&D. And then, if it was so unlikely in the future, we thought it was likely, but they didn't, that they'd end up selling phones, we'd get a royalty on each phone. And so the operators were very anxious to have this move ahead because CDMA had the possibility of fitting many more subscribers into a given amount of radio spectrum. Radio spectrum is very dear and limited. And so they did urge the manufacturers to work with us, even though everybody was skeptical. We did sign licenses uh, with both uh, initially AT&T, then Motorola, later Nokia, and now I think there's about 180 different licenses that have been signed to go ahead and provide us with some of this funding for uh, doing CDMA. In uh, the first system actually went uh, into operation in Hong Kong in 1995. We went through a standards process, developed chips, went through a standards process, went uh, into operation in 1995. And uh, I would say that, with pride, that the phones that were used in that Hong Kong system and then two additional systems that were used in South Korea the following year were all manufactured in San Diego and shipped out. So we did start out with a lead uh, with, with, with cell phones. Um, we were also manufacturing some of the infrastructure as well. Despite that, uh, I've got up a quote, and again, when you have detractors, uh, they, they, they keep at it, even though we now had some small systems, admittedly, uh, operating. And so there was this article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal about Jacob's Patter that I had somehow talked people into risking billions of dollars to go with CDMA rather than following a more obvious approach. And they did quote one Stanford professor there was actually two of them there, but they quoted one, that there are fundamental problems that uh, we just don't know how to solve. And so I still I go up actually to Stanford to give a talk about once a year, <laughs> and I still point out to them that CDMA is now successfully working everywhere in the world, except within a 10-mile radius of Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, CDMA and TDMA battled out uh, GSM as a TDMA technology. The European countries had agreed they'd only use GSM so in second generation, so there was no opening for CDMA there. Uh, but in going to third generation, everybody is using uh, one of three forms of CDMA. So it's all CDMA in third generation. 
The reason was that third gener sec first generation was FM radio, second generation was focused on voice communications, third generation is voice plus data communications. And to do that effectively, CDMA is by far the best approach. Everybody tried to avoid using CDMA and eventually did accept it. So we did very well there. On these little chips that I mentioned, for that very first phone we used to demonstrate that CMA did work and then shipped to Hong Kong, shipped to South Korea, there were three chips needed just to do the CDMA communications. Nowadays, we have one chip, and it's a major business for Qualcomm, but we make one chip that on that one chip not only does all the communications for second, third, and now some fourth generation communications, but also as you know, has a very powerful, and was mentioned, a very powerful computer on that one chip, plus a GPS receiver, plus a digital signal processor, plus video capabilities for, video, for receiving and, and taking uh, video. Uh, just a tremendous amount of capability on chip. And so these devices that we carry around with us are now amazing devices. And of course, as Moore's Law continues, to proceed ahead, we have still a lot more things yet to accomplish. And I've noted down the bottom here that uh, presently we're shipping uh, in many phones and devices a one gigahertz processor on a piece of that chip that uses very little battery power that is equivalent to some of us that remember back to the DEC computers, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, VAX computers, that's equivalent to about 2200 VAX computers, this one little piece of one chip. And that's the result of Moore's Law. And it keeps moving ahead. We're now going to two more generations after that, so we're getting to chips that will uh, have multi-cores, each one at about two and a half gigahertz capability with more computing being done per cycle, so even more powerful, and again, running on battery power. So the device world, indeed, is very exciting. How has this been accepted? Well, I think everybody knows the mobile phone is now the largest platform in history, about 5 billion subscribers, rapidly transitioning into third generation, and um, that will uh, continue to move ahead. The capability of the chips uh, have allowed now, of course, smartphones to be developed, and they're getting to be a significant part of the market. And it's interesting, just I don't know, about three years ago when I talk about a smartphone being able to do many, many different applications, most people were skeptical because they said, well, we can learn to use one capability, but you know, trying to have a Swiss knife of, uh, of this, of having lots of capabilities, nobody's going to know how to use it and they won't accept it. And then, of course, the Apple iPhone came out and showed that, indeed, there was a user interface that could allow you to make many different applications, and that was indeed a major breakthrough. And of course, now following that, all types of capabilities are being put into the phones. Well, I won't try to go into the details on the technology to other than to say the technology is moving ahead fairly rapidly. We continue to find better ways of supporting both voice and data. When I mentioned earlier that the reason that the operators wanted to go with CDMA was that we could get more subscribers into a given amount of bandwidth. And at the time, we were saying we would be able to get 10 to 20 times the number of subscribers that you could get with the original first generation. And there again, there were many, many skeptics that this was terribly overstating the case. Well, I will say with that, some of our latest developments on CDMA were up over 40 times. So we actually have more than met our requirements. Other technologies, are all, these are all, uh, the top three are all based on CDMA, continue to improve and now are being installed pretty much around the world. So access to the internet, talked about the internet earlier, uh, largely is going to be for most people through a mobile device. And there's a fourth generation based on yet another technology, OFDMA, that is now being put in place does not provide more efficiency, that is more users in a given amount of spectrum, but allows you to put a number of frequencies together and as a result, get more capacity. And as I'm about to mention, there are 
other ways of doing that as well. Uh, we see now that we're now probably moving out of the time of the laptop computer. We moved away from the desktop, other than some very powerful workstations, to the laptops, and now I think we're uh, very much uh, moving ahead to uh, following the iPad approach of having uh, different devices that we can carry. I think the main differences are going to be in the size of these devices, but the computing power, the ability to have the cameras, to have the GPS, to have all these other capabilities on board are going to make them very uh, desirable. And since they're based essentially on cell phone technology, they can live on a battery for a long, long time. So uh, that, I think, is the future. Now, one of the problems is that we don't, there is some additional spectrum, but not a large amount of additional spectrum. And more and more people are wanting to use these devices to look at video on demand, YouTube, particular sports programs, whatever. And that, again, begins to chew up a lot of the spectrum. And we're about as far, we can still make some improvements, but we can't make huge improvements in the given amount of uh, efficiency of the technology. But what we can do is use some spectrum that's been unused to date. It's what, right now, all your cellular calls are carried on one frequency band to the phone and a different frequency band from the phone. So we, we're using two different frequency bands. But it's possible to get additional frequencies which only go in one direction, say, to the phone, and use that to cover a lot more of the of the TV that's going to the phone. You still will uh, generate some video and want to send it out from the phone, but much of the data traffic is coming to the phone. And so we're using that. We're also providing capabilities to use multiple frequencies, bind them together, and to get some more efficiency just by sharing, as well as getting higher peak rates. So all these are moving ahead. I think as we look further, we're going to see the networks themselves change quite a bit. Just as you have an access point perhaps in your office or in your home for Wi-Fi, you'll end up with access points in your home that support wide area communications, both data and voice. Step outside and immediately hands off to a small cell wide area and you go further and be to a wide cell. So we'll get additional frequency reuse through these approaches on the uh, uh, design of the networks. Now, how are we using these devices? Well, clearly you, you use them for many different uses, but some other approaches are becoming more prevalent. Uh, mobile commerce uh, is beginning to grow, and now there are now near-field devices we're also building in on the chip so that you can uh, uh, go and do a swipe with your, your device and transfer a payment that way. There'll be a variety of different approaches for this. By the way, a key issue here since your phones could be lost or stolen, is authentication. Can you prove you are the owner of the phone, who you say you are? And there are a variety of ways of doing that. I think we're all used to PIN numbers, which are a little inconvenient. But there's groups working here at Johns Hopkins on voice identification so that you can, when you speak in the phone, it's going to know, are you really Erwin Jacobs or are you somebody else? And uh, give you the authentication, in which case you can use it for a lot of these areas that are sensitive or that require privacy as well. So I think we're moving certainly toward uh, much more mobile commerce. By the way, in developing countries where credit cards are not at all prevalent, uh, people are moving already to the use of cell phones for banking and for uh, uh, credit. So this, this whole thing is moving ahead and some of the applications move faster in developing countries than in developed. We talk about five billion subscribers. We're thinking of person-to-person -person communications, but more and more we're getting machine-to-machine -machine communications. Uh, the Kindle, for example, the e-book reader, even though you, you order a book and get a book, you don't realize that it's really occurring over a cellular network. And the price, the price is built into the price of the book rather than you paying separately for that. And more and more devices will run over a cellular network. Uh, talk about a smart grid, we have to find better ways of generating, distributing, conserving energy. And clearly, for example, meters are now more and more having wireless chips in them and being able to communicate. That can be two-way so that you can also get some control on the usage. That probably will become even more important as we all get more electric vehicles, if we do. 
The other thing that's happening, we have this very smart device we're carrying with us. It itself can have a number of different sensors. So we're used to that now with the various smartphones. They can recognize the attitude uh, uh, um, capability. Now even a barometer is being built in. So if you're in a building, you can get a better feeling for where you are in that building, what, what height, which floor. Um, the more interesting aspects are going to be uh, sensors that, for example, sense the environment. So you can be sensing some disease uh, organisms uh, in the air. You can be sensing the quality of the network. Uh, there's a variety of different things that can be sensed. And then, because, again, there's five billion of these around, be able to paint a very good picture of the world around you. I think the uh, a very key application of this is going to be sensors that are either bandages on you, internal, or just close to you, uh, sensing a whole variety of different issues. And so we'll be able to see a transformation, I believe, of medicine when you're outside of the hospital. A lot of this will be used in the hospital. But being able to monitor your, your health and report, the phone will report to you if there's a need for improvements, or to your family, or to the doctor. And we're already seeing this uh, as a public company um, in the case of those uh, watching cardiac functions and seeing it working much more effectively. We can also see this one of the problems uh, these days uh, with medical care. If you go in a hospital, often you come out, you don't get the same care at home that you're getting, nobody there to check up on you, and a significant percentage of patients end up going back to the hospital within a few week period. Well, with monitors, we can keep track of that understand better how to provide treatment, or is there really a need to come back to the hospital? I think we can improve care, reduce costs. I think this is going to be happening uh, to a large extent going forward. Devices will continue to improve. We talked about the chips. Uh, the batteries will slowly improve. Um, the displays are actually one of the devices that use a lot of energy right now. And ideally, we'd like to be able to view them in bright sunlight. So. Uh, one of the great advantages of the ebook reader that's based on e-ink is that you can read it in bright light. You don't uh, need a, a backlight to see that. Backlights obviously use up significant energy, and so you're both using energy and you can't use it in, in, in an extremely bright environment. And so again, new technology is coming along. This one involves MEMS uh, technology, uh, microelectronic mechanical systems technology. But anyway, just little mirrors, very tiny mirrors. In one position, the mirror reflects nothing, that is, it's black. In a second position, from the incoming light, some reflects off the surface, some reflects off the mirror. They interfere and give you a color. So interferometry providing color. The mirrors can be moved, take some energy to move them, very little, but take some energy to move them. But once they're moved, they stay in that position until you want to move them again. And so you can show images without using large amounts of power. They're very tiny. You can move them very quickly. And so you can show video as well as having static displays. And in fact, I think one of the things, you know, the, the digital watch for a while was popular, but you had to press a button to see the time. And so they never really took off. And we're all back to hands that we look at. But with a device that you can leave on at all time and only changes when the second changes, for example, uh, doesn't use any, much energy, doesn't kill the battery. And so we may, in fact, see more and more of the pure digital and uh, digital displays on those. Well, another area that's getting a lot of interest, we're very interested in it ourselves, has to do with what we call augmented reality. That is, seeing something that really isn't there that the computer is supplying in addition to the actual situation. And so we're used to that on football, where you can see the uh, uh, line of scrimmage and the uh, what's 10 yards away. Um, that really aren't there. You see it on TV. You don't see it in person. Uh, that's kind of an initial form of augmented reality. Now we're beginning to look at using the cell phones for augmented reality. There's a whole variety of different programs coming along, all of which, by the way, use a large amount of computing power because you have to process the picture you're looking at 30 times a second, perhaps, look for something about it, and then display something different. So here's a case where you may be in Japan, have a road sign. Most of us can't read it. 
And so you hold your camera up, uh, your phone up, it looks through the camera and gives you an immediate translation, at least into English, <laughs> uh, that you can sound it out and hopefully find out where you're going. Uh, another use, you may uh, come to a street with a row of restaurants. Uh, you may be interested in uh, what might be there. Again, hold up your phone. Look, it shows you the different kinds of food. It allows you, if you wish, to go ahead and place your order for a particular kind of food. And so, again, you're seeing reality plus a little extra added by the computer. Um, you may indeed uh, want to know, do you have any friends in the area? Is there any music going on? So again, you can inquire from the phone and tell you where to look. The one I'm most excited about, and this is actually getting quite close, is having a little camera so you don't, in this case, you'll be holding up the phone, but even then, don't necessarily have to hold up the phone. Something that looks ahead at a face in front of you, whispers in your ear who that is, <laughs> And what was the last time you saw them? So here's a case where you hold your phone up and it gives you some information about the people there. You can pick one of them and ask for some more information, the last time you talked, et cetera. Uh, a great benefit as one gets a little further on in age. And then other games that can be played. Here's one where um, you uh, have a, a choice of a photograph. You may want to show it on your large screen TV without your Apple TV connected, and so you simply transmit it. And in fact, one of the interesting things here is that with talking about over a short distance, having very high data rate communication between the phone and other devices. And so one will be able to, for example, transmit video. In fact, the next step will be actually receiving a lot of video on the phone and separately transmitting it over to different devices. That will go along with your digital protection where you pay, to pay for watching something, but you want to take that movie with you, say, to a sporting event, to a friend's house. Well, if you have your phone with you and the information's in the phone, you can use that then to enable the friend's TV as well. So a lot of these different interesting aspects are coming along. What about the social implications? We've had a, uh, a number of projects going uh, at Qualcomm uh, in many different countries where we typically work with local partners in that country on some particular kind of application uh, pertinent to that particular country and see if, first of all, it works out and then whether it can be made commercial, whether it can go viral. And so we've had a whole range of different such projects. One with uh, microfinance, uh, the Village Phone Program. This was a program where we uh, put a box together. The box had a phone in it, had an antenna because sometimes the villages were far from a cell site, had marketing materials, and it had, importantly, an agreement with the telecom company, the cellular company, to allow the person to sell calls and keep half the money. And this began to be quite popular. Uh, of many women, uh, this was in Indonesia where we did this first, uh, we're buying the packages and becoming entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, uh, in a sense, uh, it turned out to have a short life. And the reason is that in most developing countries now, the second or third most important thing that a person can obtain is a cell phone, once you have a place to sleep and some food. And so, it was no longer unique to have somebody selling cell phone service. More and more people were getting cell phones. But the very interesting aspect is that the women who had been doing this had learned, in some sense, to be entrepreneurs and now began to sell a whole range of other services, including banking services, using the phones. So once they got started, they, they kept up. And so in that sense, very promising. Another program, how do you help people in their day-to-day -day lives, uh, uh, ways of earning a living. And so we set up a program in India, uh, Fisher Friend, and there sent some of the obvious things to the cell phone. By the way, most are illiterate, so they can't uh, read material, but so it has to either be a picture or audio, um, about weather conditions, about fish, where the fish might be biting. Most importantly, 
what price they could expect depending which port they went back to. And so it helped them raise the value of the fish, get more fish and raise the value of those fish and has been eliminating uh, the, um, uh, mid the middleman uh, from the process. And uh, it turned out to now be so successful that it is a full commercial service. I think Tata uh, Teleservices is now offering that. So uh, we did a similar one with agriculture. Uh, what should you be planting? What price can you expect to get for crops? What bugs are attacking the crops? How do you deal with them, et cetera? And that's also been working out very well. This fishing one, we've now moved down uh, to South America and again, finding the same type of capability. One of the interesting aspects, again, most of the people were illiterate, or in this case, were uh, uh, very primitive people with a different language, finding that if they could learn to read, this service would be even better, and I think is, in fact, helping improve the level of literacy, giving some incentive to go ahead to learn to read. Medical uh, is clearly going to be one of the major beneficiaries uh, of having these kind of services easily available. Um, HIV and AIDS, uh, there are clearly are pills that can be taken, as is even in developing countries, still somewhat expensive. And if you don't take them periodically, uh, it loses its effect, uh, and so it's wasted. And so these phone devices, you even see them in these countries now, pill phones, uh, an application, that remind you when to take a phone, and you acknowledge you took it so uh, someone else then knows that you, in fact, are following the regimen properly. A frequent situation is having clinics in remote areas that aren't staffed by doctors or even necessarily trained nurses. And how do you handle patients in those clinics? Um, and so we set up again with different partners, clinics providing electronic equipment, sensing equipment that can sense different aspects of a patient, transmit that back to a hospital or to a doctor, Actually, a doctor could be off with his cell phone someplace, and have them then analyze and respond back. And so that's turning out to be very, very useful. We have that in a number of different areas. Um, clearly, cell phones are very helpful for uh, elderly folks, and um, which is always folks much older than any of us. Uh, and uh, we've been looking to see how the cell phone, what applications can be more useful. This one is being done over in Spain. Clearly now with senses you can tell if somebody hasn't moved for a period of time to react to that. Somebody falling, uh, react to that. Uh, a whole range of different capabilities that can be sensed and responded to. Uh, similarly, people with different disabilities. I think computers have been long used for a while. Different approaches for tapping on keys or for using a mouse or for speaking uh, to the computers, getting back, and we're looking at how can we take those capabilities that may be more restrictive and have them usable wherever the person might be. We actually set up an interesting program a couple of years ago in China, a school for the blind, where the device with the GPS receiver inside, if that person, uh, usually young students actually, became confused as to where they are, they could press a button uh, that would immediately connect them to an operator who used the GPS signal that was being relayed back to them to tell that person where they are and what, what they can do about it. So a whole range of handling different disabilities. Uh, computers have been used for some period of time uh, in education. The thought to date has been a kind of a laptop or a desktop computer in a classroom and in fact um, that has worked, but it's helpful, but it hasn't really made a revolution in education at this point. And so I think we can do better. Uh, in the year 2000, I was with President Clinton uh, traveling uh, on the issue of how do we get through the digital divide. And that was a time before this EVDO, the high speed, the third generation data capability wasn't commercially available. So we could set up a uh, uh, prototype uh, base station and transmit in and allow high data rate to be used even pre-commercial. And so we went to a small business in uh, Whiteville, North Carolina, 
and the um, uh, businessman who was selling environmental equipment at this first uh, business, uh, but he had trouble monitoring the performance of the equipment in the field. Uh, he could dial up the internet, but it was so slow, it was very hard to check much equipment. Couldn't very easily deal with customers, couldn't deal with suppliers, etc. So we set up a demonstration how, with a high data rate connection, this would work out very well. By the way, you can see uh, uh, President Clinton looking rather interested there. We took an extra half an hour to drag him away <laughs> from, from the screen or keyboard. Uh, apparently, he didn't have one <laughs> available easily in the White House, I guess. <laughs> and so we were late for, uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, but Governor Hunt was there, and um, he has since left office, but we promised him that we would, rather than simply having a demonstration, one day return and do something a bit more serious. And so we set up a program uh, in several, uh, initially in four high schools in North Carolina. Uh, this is now in about its fifth year. Uh, but the first year, uh, we provided to certain classes in that high school, freshman classes, uh, smartphones for every um, uh, person in the class, and they could take them home with them, so have them 24-7. And we allowed, we provided internet service, uh, uh, cellular service, uh, so they could be connected to the internet no matter where they're in school or at home. So rather than just having access uh, in the school building, they had access everywhere. Now, phones have a great advantage. A, they're much less expensive. B, you don't need a technician to keep them running. Uh, C, you can update the software remotely. Uh, lots of great advantages. Well, the very first year we did it was teaching Algebra 1. And uh, there was one teacher in one of the schools that um, uh, had one class without, with the smartphone, one class without the smartphone. The class with the smartphone, 100% of the kids passed their state exam, and only 60 plus a few percent without the phones passed. And so we said, you know, what's going on here? There's always some improvement when any time you do an educational experiment, but is that all we're seeing? And the teachers were enthusiastic, et cetera, but when talking with the students, what we found out is a student would go home, have problem with the homework, typically ask a parent, parent can't help, and <laughs> give up until the next day. Here, they'd simply go on, talk to students around the state, get information, and be able to continue on. And then secondly, Students that came up with a great idea would video themselves solving the problem and send that out to all the other students and be able to help them. Uh, so last December, last January when I was out there talking with one of the teachers, he said that now in his class, the students present half the class and he only presents the second half. In the first half, he can work with students that might need the extra help and that that is indeed making a, a significant difference. So we've gone ahead, there's now bi biology, Algebra 2, et cetera, being taught. And I just heard actually something that was most exciting. These students have now reached their had reached their senior year, and they had the option of taking uh, advanced um, uh, take calculus or uh, and statistics in two terms. That something like 5% of the school opt seniors opted to do that, that 95% of the kids with the smartphones opted to do it. So it, it kind of had an interesting, lasting effect. In any case, I think we're finally, over this next decade, going to see a major revolution in education because of these devices that are mobile, relatively inexpensive, e-text, e-text with branching so you can help each student get his own personalized instruction. Teacher can keep track of that, and therefore, rather than giving separate tests, have a real understanding of how that teacher, uh, that student is doing. I think we're finally going to be entering a very major change with the help of these devices. Uh, just a couple of words of uh, <laughs> bragging about Qualcomm. One, those licenses we gave out for patents, well, we've now got have huge numbers of patents uh, available, over 12,000 here in the US that people get for that same licensing fee. And most, uh, the one that I'm most proud of, uh, there's always a question, how do you run a company? How do you make it best for people that you're working with, make them most productive, enjoyable of life. And they have a, uh, a fortune goes out each year and sends questionnaires to employees of companies. Uh, on, and we've made their list of 100 best companies every year except the very first year when they didn't, had never heard of 
Qualcomm, so I think it's now 13 years in a row. So if you work at this kind of thing, you can both have the fun with taking a new idea, have it go out and be useful to many, many people, and have a very exciting place with which to work and many exciting people to work with. And for those of you that want to start your own company, uh, you can do that and have that great fun. But also if you go to a larger company of the proper uh, approach to life, uh, you can also have great fun and be very productive. So thank you very much. Having the opportunity to sit with Dr. Jacobs is very, very rare, and it inspires me a lot to be one of those little people to, you know, do something big in my life. It was very empowering to, uh, to be able to sit down around the table with Dr. Jacobs. Uh, it's humbling as well uh, to know that th there's still a lot to achieve. It was really interesting to hear how many people in the world have been affected by this sort of technology. So he put numbers up there saying basically there are five billion people in the world who are either directly or indirectly using these sorts of technologies. So for me, that was really neat to see how one person can affect a large number of people's lives just through a single startup company. Dr. Jacobs was talking about how they put smartphones into the schools and looked at the way the math scores had improved. Because um, I'm actually interested in doing education later in life, and specifically math classes, and I really found that fascinating. And also the whole idea about taking the phone and, you know, looking at a place like a restaurant or looking for directions or the translating. He kind of did things in a very like informal fashion at, at first, you know, do what you can first and then just kind of like very systematic, very logical. Not all businesses require a plan, uh, at least right off the bat. You kind of have to think things through and you approach problems uh, as they come. We are just regular people just like him and we could accomplish big things just like he did too. I mean, it showed me that, you know, I didn't have to, you know, be like, he was smart, but I didn't have to be, you know, over the top. I didn't have to be born in a different country. I didn't have to, you know, like, you know, go out there and, like, you know, reinvent, reinvent something. He, he kind of took it step by step. Didn't have a business plan. He took it step by step. And all that stuff kind of came along later. So it just shows, you know, that, like, you know, start small and you can end up getting big.